Go ahead and open your Bibles, please, to the book of Acts this evening. The book of Acts. Very rare do I go a whole Sunday and never go to the Old Testament, but we're going to the book of Acts tonight. Acts chapter 6 is where we're going to be. Acts chapter 6. So much in this passage of Scripture, but we'll endeavor to get it done in as brief a period of time as possible. And keep your Bible open, please, because we will end up in Acts chapter 7. As the historical context of this passage goes like this, of course, the Lord has ascended. We open the book of Acts with the Lord standing there on top of the mountain telling them, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. I love how he does not say, you shall be witnesses unto me if you give out a track. You shall be witnesses unto me if you go to church. No, no, every Christian is a witness unto our Savior, whether we do are a good witness or a bad witness. I love that old poem. You're writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by all that you do and all that you say. People read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? After this, we find the disciples huddled in that upper room, all 120 of them meeting with one accord, kind of goes back to our Sunday school lesson this morning. The Holy Spirit falls on them. They get out and Simon Peter begins to preach that message on the day of Pentecost. You'll find some interesting things about Simon Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. Your New Testament records it as being 22 verses long. In those 22 verses, Simon Peter quotes 11 Old Testament scriptures. He quotes Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. He quotes Psalm 116, verses 8 through 10. And he quotes two verses from Psalm 110. He preaches a message completely filled with scripture. And as we mentioned this morning, their hearts were pricked. He told them that you're guilty. You have, ta- you have taken the life of the Son of God, and now he will rule till he hath made his enemies his footstool. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he said, repent. On that day, 3,000 are added to the local church. They're saved and baptized and added to the local church. We find it's almost as soon as that happens that we find some persecution beginning to come in. We find in chapter 4 that Peter and James are taken and beaten for the cause of Christ. They're ordered no longer to speak or to teach in his name, but they counted themselves worthy to have suffered shame for his name. We act as if coming to church with a hangnail is the same as being beaten with a cat of nine tails, but it just doesn't stack up. We don't know the type of persecution that they're going through. And they walked out after being told not to say his name anymore, praising his name as they walked out. It just seems to me like they didn't get the gist of those Sanhedrin members. In chapter 5, we find another great day where 5,000 are added to the local church. We also find in this chapter the great wisdom of a Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel. Many people believe that Gamaliel is the one that trained Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. Gamaliel says this because the council is worried because the crowds get bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more people are following this Jesus as they refer to him, Jesus of Nazareth. Gamaliel said, don't worry. If this counsel or work be of man, it will come to naught. Don't have to worry about it. It'll run its course and go away if it's of man. But he said this, but if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. And how true that was that 2,000 years later, they've still not been able to overthrow the church of Almighty God. You get to chapter 6, things are going fantastic. Yes, there's been an imprisonment. Yes, there's been a beating. Yes, there's been some, uh, uh, some threats, if you will. But things are going well in the church. Multitudes are coming. Multitudes are getting saved. And all of a sudden, the devil changes tactics. See, the devil will attack Maranatha Baptist Church from the outside all the time. You don't have to go out onto the street corners and look for a fight if you're an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist church. All you got to do is preach the word of God. The fight's going to come to you every single time. But when those attacks do not work, when those attacks do not bring about any kind of quit or any kind of surrender, what you're going to find then is that the devil is going to attack from the inside. 
all of a sudden we have some people in Acts chapter 6 that feel a little bit mistreated. They feel like they're not being taken care of like others are being taken care of and they begin to murmur. One of the biggest problems in a Bible-believing church is when people begin to murmur. It's a bad thing when someone stands up and says something out loud, but I'd rather have that than hear the constant murmuring in the background. The disciples step up and they come up with a plan. We're going to introduce in this passage of Scripture what we now know are the seven first deacons of the New Testament church. Seven men that are set apart. Seven men that have some criteria going on. And as you read about these seven men, you'll find people that take the Word of God and try to interpret it so that it fits their own little way of thinking. You find some men that want to make little of the deacons. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to hear some men. I heard one man say that the word deacon means little errand boy. They'll use this passage of scripture and they'll tell you this, that all the deacons are supposed to do is wait on tables. If that's all the deacons were supposed to do, then the criteria for the deacon would be a strong right hand that can hold a tray and a memory that can remember your order when you place it at the restaurant. You ever been to a restaurant and you sit down, there's 12 people at the restaurant and the guy refuses to write anything down and you just sit there and know that he's going to make a mistake. We're actually surprised when he doesn't. Most of the time they do. I, was, I remember this talking about a strong right hand. And last October, we finished up a meeting in Welcome, North Carolina. We were the next morning going to drive over to Madison, Alabama. We'll be at Madison Baptist Temple the next week. And so the pastor had taken us out on Friday night to Outback. And there was a group of us, about 12 or 13 people around the table. We had a waiter by the name of Gabriel. And Gabriel was doing a fine job. There wasn't any problems with the order or anything like that. The pastor, I remember, instead of ordering the salad, he had substituted the French onion soup. I remember that very well. I'll tell you why here in just a moment. After we finished eating, Gabriel came back and was gathering up dishes. And they're heavy dishes. And so he had a big stack of dishes on top of his little tray like this. And he's carrying it. And one of the ladies at our table, and it was not my wife, one of the ladies said this, Oh my, you can carry a lot of dishes. Ladies, let me help you with this, okay? You know what he's going to do? What every man would do in that situation. He's going to carry more dishes. He's going to show you just how many dishes he can carry. He's going to flex a little bit while he's carrying those dishes because he has impressed you and you have said something about it. So he just keeps piling dishes on top of this. He has this impressive mound of dishes and he begins to turn around. As he turns around, one of the dishes shifts in place. Once it shifted in place, the avalanche started. And right between my wife and I went down an entire bowl of French onion soup. When it hit the ground, the bowl shattered and French onion soup splashed up all over me and all over my wife. I had French onion soup in my hair and rolling down my glasses and all over my suit. My wife had it all over her dress, all because one lady said, oh my, you can carry a lot of dishes. If that were the criteria, if that's what a deacon is supposed to be, then you're going to find deacons having this, uh, their resume should say, I have a really strong right hand and a really good memory to order all the dishes. Other people will look at it and take the words in this passage and change them to fit fit their own belief system. They'll say that the deacons were the ones uh, set up to be over the business of the church. That's not what it says. It says this business. It is the pastor. If you know the, 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 uh, the biblical words, especially the Greek words, presbyteros and episkopos that describe what the pastor is, you know that the pastor is the one that oversees everything at a local church. We understand that. But they'll say, no, no, deacons are over the business, trying to give more authority where it's not supposed to be. That's not the business it's talking about. When you get to this passage of Scripture, it's not just saying that they're errand boys. It's not saying that they're just going to wait on tables. The business that it's describing is anything that keeps the pastor away from doing his job. The pastor's job in this passage of Scripture is specific. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. The pastor has two jobs, to pray and preach. We can divide them up into three, pray, preach, and prepare. That's what a pastor's job is. Now, let me point this out. It's, it's true of this church, of this pastor, and of your former pastor. I don't know a single pastor worth his salt that doesn't know how to unclog a toilet. 
They don't just sit in their office and hum Gregarian chants in silence with the lights off and the curtains drawn and, 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 and whisper sweet songs under their breath. So they spend 24 hours a day just praying and preparing so that they can preach. No, that's not what's going to happen. But the point is, anything in the local church that stops the pastor from, begin, from having enough time to pray, prepare, and to preach is something that needs to be spread on to somebody else. That's why deacons are here to help in every area. I know he's not called one, but I look at Aaron and her as the first examples of what a deacon really is. Holding up the hands of Moses while the battle is going on against the Amalekites. That's the deacon's job as you read this passage of Scripture. We're going to single out one deacon. The very first martyr of the New Testament church. A man by the name of Stephen. As we're going to read about Stephen, I want you to notice a couple of things about him. First off, you'll notice that Stephen wasn't anything special. He didn't have any superpowers. He wasn't able to just command the waters to part or anything of that nature. As a matter of fact, so many Bible characters, the more we read about Bible characters that accomplish great things, the more you find out that we have everything that they had when they accomplished something great. We use them almost as an excuse because they did this and this and this for the Lord. When in reality, everything that they have done for the Lord, we can do for the Lord. Amen. I want you to notice the second thing about him. Stephen stayed focused on the Savior. No matter what happened in his life, he stayed focused on the Savior. No matter what the world did, no matter what the trial, the tribulation, or the persecution, Stephen stayed focused on the Savior. But understand this, many Christians, I would even say most Christians, when we go through a trial, instead of turning away from the Savior, now there are some that do that, when they go through a trial, they want to blame the Lord for it. They don't want to take any responsibility of it upon themselves. They want to blame the Lord. There are a few people like that. But most Christians, when they go through a trial, it's easy then to turn your attention back to him. When everybody else has let us down, that's when we turn to our Savior, isn't it? Most of us have a problem, though, not uh, in keeping our focus on him, not when we're going through a trial, but when we're going through a triumph. We start seeing great things happen. We start having services like we had this morning. We see three people walk in the aisle. And by the way, if you ever get over the fact that three people trusted Christ as their personal Savior this morning, as a result, as I understand it, most of them as a result of the bus ministry. You start getting over that, you need to find a place at an altar somewhere and hit it as quickly as you can. But what happens is sometimes when things are going really well and you have a mountaintop experience, that's when we lose our focus on the Lord. In this passage of Scripture, Stephen is going to stay focused on the Lord in persecution and in triumph. You're going to watch as this first martyr of the New Testament church accomplishes a great deal for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 6. We're going to begin reading with, in verse 1. We'll read the whole, first, uh, the f whole uh, chapter, chapter 6, and then keep your Bible open uh, into chapter 7 here in a few moments. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Par uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Sicilia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people. 
and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. I want to preach a message on keeping your focus tonight as we look at Stephen, the first martyr of the New Testament church. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Lord, we thank you for our time together. Father, I pray that you bless the message. I pray that you'll accomplish something in our hearts tonight. I pray that you'll help us as we look at the Word of God to examine our lives in light of the Word of God. Help us, Father, to leave here differently than we came. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice the first thing that jumps off the page at me is Stephen's righteousness. The Bible describes some things about Stephen. Number one, it tells us that Stephen is a man of honest report. They're looking out seven men of honest report. A, a Christian ought to have an honest report. A Christian ought to have a good reputation and a Christian ought to have a good testimony. The Bible tells us to let your light so shine before men so they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Our lives should be a reflection of our Savior. The only, only gospel some of them are going to see, as we mentioned in the introduction, is watching our lives. I don't believe for one solitary second in what was very popular in the 70s and 80s called lifestyle evangelism. I don't believe in that at all, but I do believe that every Christian ought to have an, a, a lifestyle that evangelizes. We ought to be different. We ought to act different. We ought to look different. They ought to be, tell, be able to tell the difference between you and a lost person. And it shouldn't take them weeks and months and years to be able to figure that out. They should be able to see it almost immediately in your demeanor, in your presence, in how, in how you carry yourself, in how you look, and even how you dress. The simple fact is God's people ought to look different. We ought to have an honest report. We need to have a good reputation. I define reputation as this, is what people that see your life think about you. It's different than a godly testimony. A godly testimony is what people who see your life think about God. Notice Stephen had an honest report. It also says they had to be full of the Holy Ghost. That's an easy one for every single child of God in this auditorium. If you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior on the date of salvation, you received the Holy Ghost. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul still doesn't understand why the Corinthian church doesn't get this when he asks almost in this incredulous way, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. The simple fact is, the moment you got saved, the moment you trusted Christ as your personal Savior, you were filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, he might not have all of you, but you got all of him on that day. So Stephen's got an honest report. Every one of us should be able to have an honest report before God and the world. Stephen was a man full of the Holy Ghost. Every one of us should be a person, is a person, if we're saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. He was a man also full of faith. Faith is one of those things that grows with our Christian life, isn't it? When it starts out as a grain of mustard seed, it doesn't take very many mountains moved out of your place, out of their place, and out of your way before your faith continues to grow and grow and grow. And the next thing you know, you read in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 about all these men and women that had such great faith. The fact is, we can accomplish anything through the faith of God, but we can have that just by trusting Him. He's a man of honest report. He's a man full of faith. He's a man full of the Holy Ghost. He's a man full of wisdom. See, Brother Harper, are you trying to tell me that churches are filled with, with smart people? Nope. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying this. There's not an excuse in the world for a Christian not to be wise. Oh, you don't have to have an IIQ and get straight A's to be wise. The Bible tells us where wisdom comes from. It's one of those few things that comes from multiple sources, doesn't it? Doesn't the Bible tell us in the book of Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? You can have wisdom just by knowing the Lord, just by fearing the Lord. We can have the wisdom of Almighty God. Daniel chapter 12 tells us that he that winneth souls is wise. So the fact is, being a soul winner will make us wise. Then, if those two don't work for you, how about what James says? If any of you lack wisdom, 
Let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. There is not an excuse in the world for a child of God not to be filled with the wisdom of God. So here we find Stephen. He's a man full of faith. We can be full of faith. He's a man full of the Holy Ghost. We already are full of the Holy Ghost. He is a man full of wisdom. There's no excuse for us not to be full of wisdom. He's a man of honest report. Every Christian should be a person of honest report. In other words, Stephen should not be any different than any single one of us. We find him disputing now with those people of the synagogue of the Libertines. They're arguing with Stephen. The Bible says they were not able to resist the, uh, the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. See, it's one thing to be wise. It's another thing to have the right spirit, isn't it? Uh, a, a preacher friend of mine always puts it this way. He said, you can have the right position, but have the wrong disposition. There have been men like that over the years that even though what they're saying may be right, they say it in such an almost hate-filled way that it absolutely does no good and brings reproach on the name of Christ. That's not what happens with Stephen. When Stephen speaks, what he says is right, and the way he says it is right. Stephen's a man full of faith, wisdom. He's full of the Holy Ghost. He's a man of honest report. He's a man that speaks with great wisdom and with the right spirit. And all of a sudden, you start looking around and the number of the disciples. Remember, there's 8,000 people there now. 3,000 at one time, 5,000 at another. And the numbers of the disciples multiplied greatly. We have no idea numerically what has happened now that Stephen and the other six deacons are helping out the pastors so they can devote themselves to preaching and praying. But it is so magnificent that the Bible just calls it multiplication, great multiplication. Things are going great. These people that can't argue with Stephen, what do they do? They decide to tell some people to lie about him. As a preacher, there are lots of accusations that can be made over pre about preachers over the years. And I'm not talking about application, uh, accusations about sin. Oh, well, he just preaches the same thing all the time. Oh, well, he's not very friendly. Oh, well, he's a little aloof. Oh, he's arrogant. You hear all these kinds of things. And preachers, sometimes, sometimes there's some truth to some of that. Sometimes there's not at all. But preachers just go through and keep on going with that accusation. But I want you to notice what they accuse Stephen of. And I don't know a Bible-believing pastor that would put up with this accusation. Notice what it says about this when they accuse Stephen. It's in verse 11. And they suborn men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. A Bible-believing pastor who has studied and prepared and is giving himself continually to prayer and the ministry of the Word is not going to let you get by with telling him he's a blasphemer. By the way, they prove they don't actually know what the word blaspheme means because they said he's blasphemed Moses. You can't blaspheme Moses. Moses isn't a deity. Moses is just a man. You can criticize Moses. You can't blaspheme someone that's not deity. Blaspheme Moses and God. Gets everybody fired up. They arrest Stephen. They take him to the council. That's the Sanhedrin. They're going to stand him before these religious leaders. And just to make sure that they have everything in place, they have hired false witnesses. They have set up men. They're going to come in and lie about Stephen. Now, let's be clear. Their lies are filled with half-truths. They say, we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth is going to destroy this temple. Well, Jesus did say that he was going to destroy the temple. But what they did, they half quoted him, did they not? I'm sure Stephen is repeating what Jesus has said when he says that. What he meant was he's going to destroy this temple, the temple of his body, and raise it again in three days. By the way, they leave the raise it again in three days part off completely. They leave the part that it was his own body that he was talking about off completely. And they use a half truth to criticize Stephen, to accuse him of blasphemy. Not only do they accuse him of blasphemy, they accuse him of saying this Jesus of Nazareth is going to change the customs which Moses delivered us. No, the New Testament still honors the Old Testament and the law. Remember what it says? The law is a schoolmaster that brings us unto grace. We don't answer to the law anymore. We have the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus preached that same grace. He preached about repentance. He preached about salvation. That's what Stephen is preaching. That's why the numbers of the disciples are multiplying greatly. Stephen stands up to this accusation. 
Notice, number one, we saw Stephen's righteousness. Number two, we see this Sanhedrin's review as they question him, as they accuse him. They could not come up with anybody that could prove anything, so they hire people to lie. Now Stephen's going to speak. It's now it's time for Stephen to offer his defense. Now, I will be honest, if it were me, if someone had said that, oh, Brother Harper's been blaspheming the Lord and took bits and pieces out of messages to make it sound like I said something that I had not said, I would go to YouTube or any other of the sites that have my messages. I would play my messages over and over. I would show them the rest of the context. I would spend my time proving my innocence. And I think many others would as well. But that's not what Stephen does. You know what you don't find? You don't find Stephen saying, nope, you guys are lying. You don't find Stephen saying, I would never blaspheme the Lord. I've never said that. You're only half quoting me. You're not getting it right. Stephen stands up to offer his defense. And his face looks like it's the face of an angel. What do you think the Sanhedrin did when Stephen's face begins to glow like the noonday sun? I think for a moment they were taken aback. But Stephen doesn't say with his glowing angelic face, Stephen is innocent. Stephen is not guilty of any of those things. Stephen looks around and realizes that he has a captive audience. <laughs> Every preacher loves a captive audience. There's something about it if they know that you cannot possibly leave. You preach in a prison, they can't go anywhere. They have to listen to the whole message. Stephen has a captive audience. Stephen, with his angelically glowing face, says, While we're here, why don't you open your Bible to the book of Genesis? You'll find for 50 verses, Stephen quotes Scripture. For 50 verses, people, Stephen rehearses the history of the nation of Israel straight from the Bible. Stephen stands up. He starts with Abraham getting called. He goes through Isaac, goes through Jacob, meanders his way through Moses, finally gets to David, and he just continues to preach and tell them everything that they need to know about how all of these have been looking forward to the Christ and his coming. See, when Stephen met the Sanhedrin's review, he didn't defend Stephen, he defended Almighty God. He just preached the scriptures. I want you to notice, number one, Stephen's righteousness. Number two, the Sanhedrin's review. And now after 50 verses of quoting Scripture, after 50 verses of the Word of God penetrating their hearts, in this passage, as we mentioned this morning, they're cut to the heart. Holy Ghost is doing his job. Stephen is doing his job. We would expect at the end of this, just like on the day of Pentecost, just like the two disciples on the road back from Emmaus to, uh, to Jerusalem, we would expect the next thing to be, abide with us. The next thing to be, him crying out and saying, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's not the response. By the way, Stephen obviously never read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, because Stephen's going to wrap up his message Notice, if you will, please, you're in chapter 7 with me now. Look at verse, 11, uh, verse 51. Stephen is finished and says this, Ye stiff-necked, ye stubborn and uncircumcised in hearts and ears. Now these are the Jews of the Jews. These are the Jews that attempt to keep every single law. These are the Jews that are pharisaical. These are the Jews that want to tell everybody else what's wrong with them. And then to say that they're uncircumcised in their hearts and their ears. That's such a, uh, such a, a, a mean statement that Stephen makes to them. He said, on the outside you might be Jews, on the inside you're a bunch of Gentiles. Obviously, he's going to make them upset when he says that. Every word of it is true, but it's going to make them upset. But then he goes on. Not only, I want you to notice Stephen's stern rebuke. I want you to notice that Stephen doesn't just talk about them. He talks about their families. He talks about their ancestry. If it were appropriate to do so, Stephen is basically telling yo mama jokes to these people. Anybody under the age of 30 got that? The rest of you are going, what? But anyway, he says, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? 
You want to sit there and tell me about Isaiah. Your grandfather tormented Isaiah. Oh, you want to quote to me Jeremiah. Your great-grandfather been prison Jeremiah. You want to talk about Elijah. Your family went after Elijah. You persecuted every single prophet that ever told that the Messiah is going to come. Now you want to sit here and tell me that I've misinterpreted who the Messiah is. Not only that, not only did your dads persecute them, but they have slain them, which told before of the coming of the just one. Hmm. You want to look back at your legacy? You want to talk about how your Hebrews of the Hebrews and Jews of the Jews? Remember what your lineage is. Your lineage is a bunch of pro- a prophet persecutors and a bunch of prophet murderers. You've got blood on your hands as you sit here. The very scriptures you're trying to quote were written by men that you persecuted telling you, Stephen does not hold back. Remember, he's been accused of blasphemy. The punishment for blasphemy is stoning. His life is on the line. But he doesn't back down from the truth. He doesn't waver. His knees do not get weak. His voice doesn't quiver. Yes, stiff-necked. I'm circumcised in hearts and ears. Which of the prophets? Uh, uh, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one. But if that's not enough, of whom ye have now been the betrayers and the murderers, all this time you've been looking for Messiah, and when he showed up, you killed him. You have taken, just as Peter said to those on the day of Pentecost, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain the just one. The very same term that uh, Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. All your dads were bad because they persecuted and murdered the prophets, but you're worse. You betrayed and murdered the Son of God. He will reign, as Peter put it, until he hath made his foes his footstool. Could you imagine the possibility, even the possibility of being forgiven for taking the Son of God by wicked hands and slaying him? See, that's why the day of Pentecost, they all cried out, what can we do? How hopeless is it if your hands were laid on the Son of God and he's going to be your judge and jury? Peter says, repent. Perhaps Stephen is expecting the same thing. There's certainly the same, the same message that he's preaching, the same Bible that he's preaching, the same warnings that he's preaching. He's telling them, you've betrayed and you've murdered the just one. You've murdered the Son of God. You've murdered the Christ. You've murdered the Messiah. You've murdered the Son of David. You're guilty. You want to try me? With my face glowing like an angel, you're far more guilty than I am. That's a pretty stern rebuke, isn't it? What they should have done is cried out and said, Lord, save me. He finishes up by saying this, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. That probably made them matter than anything else. The one thing they prided themselves on was keeping the law. And now Stephen says, the very law that you've received by the disposition of angels, you're not even keeping it. Notice number one, Stephen's righteousness. Number two, the Sanhedrin's review. Number three, his stern rebuke. But now watch this. Everything is in place for them to get saved. Their hearts have been cut. They've heard the word of God preached. They've had their sins pointed out. But I want you to notice number four, their sad response. Instead of responding, instead of trusting, instead of believing, watch what it says in verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. It's not saying here that they bit him. That's not what the phrase means. It means that they've gnashed on, it, gnashed on him or gnashed at him with their teeth. In other words, they're gritting their teeth at him. They're so angry. Stephen doesn't even seem to notice. They do even more. Watch what happens next, please. And by the way, I will have to say this. I have a little bit of respect for these men. Look at verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. At least they were bold enough to let Stephen know they stopped listening. 
I wonder how many times your pastor's been standing in this pulpit and he's gotten halfway through the, the message and you've just turned him off. You've looked down at your phone. Your watch buzzed on your, on your arm and you had to read your texts. How many times? I would much more respect someone who just stood up and went like this as someone who tried to hide the fact that they weren't even listening. They cried with a loud voice. They stopped their ears like children who are arguing with one another. You ever seen two children arguing about which one is better, Superman or Batman? Let's just use them. And one says, well, it's uh, uh, Spider-Man or Batman. Well, Spider-Man shoots a web. Well, uh, Batman has the, the Batmobile. And on and on it goes until one of them finally makes an argument that the other one can't defeat. And the, uh, the one uh, puts his fingers in his ears and goes, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. That's exactly what's happening here. They're acting like children. Instead of responding, instead of acknowledging that all the scripture they've heard, all the preaching that has been delivered to them has cut their heart and should change their lives, instead they decide to stop listening, they decide to stop their ears, they decide to cry with a loud voice. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. Hasn't even been found guilty yet. They're not stoning him because he was guilty of blaspheming. They're stoning him because they're just mad and don't like his message. It's the second time that's happened, Brother Tim. It's my fault, I'm sure. Now we're better. They're stoning him because they don't like his message. Isn't that what happens to modern day Bible believing preachers? People don't like their message, so they get mad. They're going someplace else. People don't like their message because it stepped on their toes. And by the way, that's just a misnomer. That means it convicted your heart. But stepping on our toes sounds easier. They're just going to take him out and stone him now. We can't prove that he's guilty of blasphemy, but we can prove he's guilty of making us mad. Notice their sad response. Notice quickly, though, the silent results. I find this extremely interesting as we look at it. Look at verse 58. And cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses. That word appears twice in this narrative. The witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. In chapter 6, what does it tell us? And they set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place. I cannot tell you for sure that Saul of Tarsus, although he was, he did feel that it made him zealous uh, to persecute the church. We do know that Saul of Tarsus was breathing out cursings. He was looking to imprison and to arrest uh, Christians for believing in Jesus Christ. I cannot tell you that he's involved in the plot, if you will, to get Stephen. But it sure looks like the very same witnesses that they hired Trusted Saul of Tarsus. Here you are in a battle. You're picking up stones to, st uh, to, uh, to murder Stephen. And that's what it is, by the way. If you, are, uh, if you face capital punishment, you've never been convicted of a crime. That's called a murder. When they want to throw a stone and hit Stephen really well, they take their jackets off and they say, Here, Saul, hold this. Saul's from Tarsus. He might be known in Jerusalem, but these people know him well enough to trust him. It seems as if Saul might have had something to do with this to me. Whether he did or not, he's there. Don't you think he's sitting there holding the coats of those that are stoning Stephen, waiting for Stephen to look at him with hate in his eyes? Waiting for Stephen to shake his fist at Saul and say, you finally got me, but you're not going to win, or something along that line. Don't you think that's what he's expecting? That's what everybody else that he's ever persecuted for any other reason has done. But these Christians are just different. And the stones are hitting Stephen in his head. Notice what he says, please, as they're stoning him. But when... I'm sorry, at chapter 7, look if you will please at verse 59. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. 
We find in chapter 9 that Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus road, the Lord says unto him, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I am firm in my belief that the pricks that he's talking about here is the conviction in his heart of watching Stephen kneeling down, praying for Saul of Tarsus with his last breath. By the way, the closer you get to the Lord, the more you sound like him. Didn't our Savior say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? Now we find Stephen kneeling there saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Say, Brother Harper, wait a minute, you're reading too much into that. Well, maybe I am, but maybe I'm not. In Acts chapter 22, we find Saul of Tarsus, or Paul the Apostle now, giving his personal testimony. And do you know where he started when he gave his personal testimony in verse 6? He said, and when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed... I also stood by and was consenting unto his death. When Paul gave his testimony, he starts with Stephen. There's some silent results here. Do you know when Stephen died, he didn't have any converts? Oh, he'd made some people mad. He didn't have any converts. There weren't a whole bunch of people saying, well, I follow Stephen. He's, he's my favorite preacher. No, nope, that's not what's going on. Stephen, without this passage of Scripture, would just die in anonymity, would he not? When Stephen died, he didn't have a single person that trusted Christ because of him. And yet, every person in this auditorium tonight can trace your spiritual lineage in one way or another back to the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul traced his spiritual lineage Back to Stephen. As is said of Abel in Hebrews chapter 11, he being dead yet speaketh. Christian, there might be someone you've been praying for for 20 years and they haven't gotten saved. And you're about ready to give up. Listen, just keep praying. You might not even be around when they get saved. The famous George Mueller, perhaps the greatest prayer warrior of the last 500 years. When he died, they opened up his prayer journal and there were over 51,000 dated, recorded, and specific answers to prayer. He prayed for 40 years for his lost brother. George Mueller died, his brother was still lost. George Mueller's funeral, if I remember correctly, was on a Tuesday that Friday, his brother trusted Christ as his personal Savior. Don't give up hope, Christian. There might be some silent results just around the corner for you. But notice Stephen's focus. The stones are hitting him. And he looks at his Lord. He's being mistreated. He's being rejected. He's being blasphemed. He's being accused. All of these things that are happening, they're gnashing on him with their teeth. They're crying with a loud voice. They're stopping their ears. They've grabbed him by the collar. They've thrown him out of the city. They're pelting his head with rocks. And yet Stephen never lost his focus on the Lord. Never a moment of Why? Never a moment of, I don't deserve this, Lord. Never a moment where he says, well, I was just trying to do the right thing, and look what it got me. No, that doesn't happen. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I want you to notice, number one, Stephen's righteousness. Number two, the Sanhedrin's review. Number three, his stern rebuke. Number four, their sad response. Number five, the silent results. And number six, the special reception. No one in recorded scripture has this happen, save for Stephen. Some would say it's because he's the first martyr. I don't know if that's the case. It would seem he would have to stand with every martyr. But something Stephen sees. Notice what the Bible says. Go back to verse 55 with me. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, look up steadfastly into heaven. See that phrase? Into heaven. Now watch this. And saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. 
What do you expect is next? Stephen looked up steadfastly into heaven. He saw the glory of of God. There are the six winged angels around the throne of God singing holy, holy, and holy. He's looking up into heaven. He sees a wall of jasper. He sees a gate of pearl. He sees the street of gold. He sees all the glories of heaven and Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. You would expect that Stephen's next words would be, I see the heaven open and the street is gold, y'all. The walls are jasper. The gates are pearl. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's breathtaking. I can't wait to get there. I can see up the street. My mansion is right there. I can't wait to be there. That's what we'd expect. That's what every song about it almost says. The glory of heaven, harp, home, a crown. But notice... Stephen looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Can I point this out? Stephen didn't notice the wall. He didn't notice the gate. He didn't notice the street. He didn't notice the throne. He didn't notice the brightness of glory. The only thing he saw was Jesus standing there. See, Christian, I love the old song that says, Oft times the day seems long. Our trial's hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur, and despair. But Christ will soon appear. To catch his bride away, all tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ I believe, Pastor, that we'll be in heaven for the first 10,000 years, standing around the throne, singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive glory and power and majesty and honor. And one of us is going to go, Hey, it is gold. What I'm saying is this, Christian, Stephen didn't lose his focus when he, like no one else that's ever lived, looked up into heaven and saw the glory of God in his natural life here. He wasn't focused on the blessings of heaven. He wasn't focused on the glory of God. He was still just focused on Jesus. See, he didn't lose his focus when the stones were hitting him. He didn't lose his focus when they cried with a loud voice. He didn't lose his focus when they stopped their ears. They didn't lose his focus when they grabbed him and threw him out of the city and ran upon him with one accord. He didn't lose his focus when they rejected the invitation that he offered. But he also didn't lose his focus because of a street or a wall or a gate or a throne. His focus never wavered from Jesus Christ. The difference between Stephen and us is that everything distracts us. Everything causes us to turn our head. Everything causes us to forget him. The simple truth of the matter is, Christian, if you get nothing else from Stephen, it's that the Lord should be the center of our focus in every day, in every activity, and at every moment instead of relegated to whatever extra time we have left over. If he's the center of your focus, you've canceled a lot of things so you can be in revival every night. If he's the center of your focus, there are things that you don't do anymore, things that you don't watch anymore, places you don't go anymore. But we're so easy to be distracted, but not Stephen. Like you and I, he was of good report. 
Like you and I, he was full of the Holy Ghost, full of faith, full of wisdom, with the right spirit. Like you and I, because of that, he was accused. He was attacked. And yet we find him standing up and is ready always to give an answer to every man of the hope that lieth within you. And for 50 verses, he preaches the word of God. He calls on them to repent of their sin, but they do not. And yet he never took his eyes off Jesus. Lord, receive my spirit. When you stop and think about it, it's a pretty sweet home going, isn't it? With the Savior standing there. And I realize I'm adding, standing there, I believe, with open arms. Waiting, precious in the sight of the Lord, is the death of his saints. How about it, Christian? Do you line up with Stephen? We can. Just keep...